Welcome to this episode about Hilton Head Island and the Low Country. In this episode, we learn about some of the names associated with Hilton Head Island and the surrounding area. Rich Thomas of Hilton Head History Tours will share with us where these names came from as we travel down 278 to Lighthouse Road. Rich Thomas is a 23-year resident of Hilton Head and founder of Legacy Leadership of the Low Country. They specialize in experiential leadership and team development programs using historic events as a framework for learning. He is also owner and a guide for Hilton Head History Tours. Rich also has a book available called Backwater Frontier. It focuses on singular stories of leadership in various contexts to track and reveal a remarkable pattern of leading-edge developments which solely direct or heavily influenced the subsequent course of history across the entire American landscape. Rich, welcome to the show. Jay, it's a pleasure. Thank you again for having me. Now, I'd like to start before we get into some of the names, the street names around Hilton Head. Hilton Head Island actually had several names through history before it finally settled on Hilton Head Island. Can you share with us a few of those names and and how they came about? Sure, sure. I mean, uh, the first one really relates to the story of Santa Elena, and that was one of the early uh, expeditions to the north scouting along the coast. Uh, It was actually in 1525 that a man named Pedro de Quejo, who was scouting for uh, Luis Vasquez de Ayon, who was the Spanish he was a judge in the in the court in Santo Domingo, but he uh, commissioned Keho to cruise the coast and look for a place to locate a potential colony. Keho had been here in 1521. He came back in 1525. Uh, it fit the bill perfectly and was the location that he went back and recommended. Uh, he also carried a chart with him that listed Hilton Head Island on the chart as La Punta de Santa Elena. And that was in the fall, in September of 1525. Well, in December of 1525, his boss, the Ion, sent the chart along with some letters to the royal cartographer in Spain, who was a man named Juan Vespucci, who was actually the son of Amerigo Vespucci, for whom or from whom America gets its name. Vespucci, in a map that he prepared as a wedding present for King Carlos and Queen Isabella for their marriage the following that March, that map listed Hilton Head Island on the map named Cabo de Santa Elena, or the Cape of Santa Elena, rather than the Point of Santa Elena. So somewhere that fall, you had the chart that Cajo supplied de Ayon uh, discussed, and de Ayon's chart that he supplied to Vespucci uh, had the name Cabo de Santa Elena. So Hilton Head was known as the Punta de Santa Elena, or the Cabo de Santa Elena, from that point on, on European maps. And then when the French came in and started doing their exploration, uh, they named the Sound Port Royal, and Hilton Head was given the name La Grande Ile, and the, the, the large island, or the Grand Island. And it maintained that name on French documents and French maps for quite a quite a time. Obviously, the Spanish kept Santa Elena as their name for it. And then really, the next one comes about in uh, the late 1600s, when the Yemisee Indians were moving into the area, and the Lord's Proprietors of Carolina felt that having the Yemisee in the southern part of their province would be a good buffer against the Spanish, because the Yemisee were their trading partners and were also allies of the English by that time. So it was called, it was offered to the chief of the Yemisee, who's his name was Altamaha, uh, as under a lease beginning in 1684, and it became known as Altamaha Island. And that was really until uh, 1698, when the land was given to uh, Lord Bailey from Ireland and uh, Lord John Bailey, and it was known as Bailey's Barony at that point. And it stayed Bailey's Barony for a few years after Lord John Bailey died. He had two sons, Peter and John Jr., and they took over his land holdings on Hilton Head. They actually came over to kind of survey the lands and check them out. But while they were here, they met a man in Charleston named Alexander Trench, who was a fellow Irishman, and he was planning to live in the in the new town of Beaufort. And so they hired Trench in 1522 
to be the sales agent for the lands that they had inherited from their father. And they didn't want any more of South Carolina and headed back to Ireland and, and told Trench to sell the lands. And then uh, it stayed as Bailey's Barony uh, really for, well, let's see, up until 1663 when William Hilton cruised into Port Royal Sound in his ship, The Adventure, and saw the headland that bears his name and gave it his name, Hilton's Head, which was shortened to Hilton Head after that. And then Hilton Head was the name really up until uh, you've got the Civil War days. And the Civil War days, the Union headquarters was on Hilton Head Island. The post office for the entire Port Royal Sound area was on Hilton Head, and it was called Port Royal. And so Hilton Head, as well as the entire area from 1862 to 1872, was known as Port Royal. And then it reverted to Hilton Head after that. And then really the the last formal name comes about when Hilton Head voted to essentially remove itself from the jurisdiction of Beaufort County for the purpose of zoning regulations. And that was in 1983 when the town of Hilton Head Island was formed. And the town of Hilton Head Island is now the name for Hilton Head Island, the, the official name for Hilton Head Island. So those are some of the names that it's had throughout its uh, its historic past. It's, it's amazing how far back we had a whole episode about Santa Elena and how far back the history in Beaufort and Bluffton and Port Royal, Paris Island, Hilton Head goes, you know, all the way back to the 14, 1500s. Let's start at the the south end of the island in what is now Sea Pines was Braddock's point. Who was Braddock? So Braddock was Daniel Cutler Braddock. Daniel Cutler Braddock was the captain of a scout vessel that represented basically the South Carolina militia initially during the period that the Yemassee were still staging raids in the Port Royal Sound area. Braddock went on to maintain that scout boat station for about 20 years. And at the end of that period of time, his name was not associated with that particular part of the island. But as time went on, that became the most well-known reference point for the southern tip of Hilton Head. Braddock's Cove was the area where they anchored the scout boat, uh, and that today is South Beach, as as you know. Anyway, that was that was Braddock. And then he had a son that went on after that to cap- captain a scout boat for the militia all the way up until the Revolutionary War, when he captained a boat for the Buford District Militia as part of the Continental Forces in the American Revolution. So when you stand on South Beach, you actually look out over the Calabogie Sound, and Defusky Island is right there. Where did those two names come from, Defusky and Calabogie? So no one's absolutely absolutely sure on Calabogie, but it's it's believed that he may have well been a paramount chief of the Yemassee in their migration to the north. And when they arrived on Hilton Head, as I mentioned before, Altamaha was a paramount chief. No one really knows the, the meaning of the name Calabogie, but we know it's in a Muscogean uh, language, Native American language, Muscogean dialect word. And then Defusky is also a Yemassee word or a Muscogean word, and it means either sharp feather or pointed feather, and it takes that from its shape. Hilton Head Island and the surrounding area has a very deep history with indigo, uh, which was a crop. There's actually a name Indigo Run Drive. What was indigo and why was that such an important crop for the area? Well, so you, if, if you go back to the, really the beginning of the colony in 1670, uh, that was mostly up in the Charleston area. One of the first agricultural products of South Carolina was rice. Uh, Rice required a very uh, abundant freshwater supply, and so it could only be grown really in the freshwater rivers that tended to be pretty much upriver and inland from the coast. There was a form of rice called dry rice, and that was able to be grown on land, provided that it had the um, proper amount of moisture and irrigation. But on the sea islands, that was virtually impossible. There were very few locations that could grow rice on sea islands. One of them happened to be on Hilton Head, and that is the area that's in Sea Pines today that was formerly known as Lawton Plantation uh, or in Calabogia Plantation before that when it was when it started to grow rice. The use of Hilton Head's land prior to indigo was really for the grazing of livestock. Beef was another main export product from South Carolina. That whole 
episode of our history and the use of the land really ended with the Yemisee Wars because there were so many raids, so many cattle were killed during that period of time that the herds were diminished to the point that it was not a profitable venture. And into that void that's created by the end of the beef market and the inability to grow rice meaningfully on the sea islands comes the crop of indigo. And indigo comes from seeds that were provided by a um, an Antiguan man to his daughter, a 16-year-old girl at the time who was running three family plantations uh, in the Charleston area. And she experimented with seeds and was able, with the help of a couple of uh, one West African man and, and also a uh, a French West Indian man, was able to cultivate the first commercially viable crop of indigo in South Carolina in about 1740. And by 1742, indigo had spread among the Sea Island planters as a new crop that grew very well, grew like a weed in the soil that was salty and sandy on these sea islands. Very quickly, indigo became one of the major cash crops of the colony because the product was in very strong demand. The prior source of indigo had been and primarily French West Indian islands, uh, some in the British West Indies, but mostly from French West Indies. And when South Carolina came on stream, the quality of its indigo was judged to be superior to that of that from the French West Indies. And so it was in high demand in England. And the people who converted to indigo and grew indigo became extremely wealthy people in the days leading up to the American Revolution. And on the eve of the revolution, uh, indigo accounted for nearly 40% of the total export revenue of the colony at that time. And South Carolina, just prior to the revolution, was the richest British crown colony in the world, even richer than India. So it was a remarkable crop for not only Hilton Head, but the rest of the Sea Islands and for the economy of South Carolina. It's amazing what a plant can do for an economy. (laughs) (laughs) That's for sure. Also down on the south end of the island is a road called Cordillo Parkway. Who was Cordillo? So I mentioned earlier the voyage in 1521 of Pedro de Quejo into the Port Royal Sound. What had happened is that uh, Quejo actually met this man named uh, Gordillo was his Spanish name, Francisco Gordillo. And Gordillo was commissioned to explore to the north and west of the Bahamas for a possible source of native slaves. And so he he goes up, he actually was ordered to scout the Bahamas first, but the Bahamas were pretty well cleaned out of indigenous people by that time. Off of Andros Island in the Bahamas, he meets Pedro de Quejo, and it turned out that Gordillo's cousin was a crew man on Quejo's ship. So the two ships talked about what they were up to, and they figured out they're on the same mission, so they decided to join forces and sailed north uh, along the coast. And it's Gordillo who is credited in the urban legend world of Hilton Head, who is credited with actually being the first person to record Hilton Head Island in history, although it wasn't named Hilton Head. In fact, it wasn't given a name. But it was just noted as a large land mass at 3230 North Latitude, and that corresponds to Hilton Head's coordinate. Gordillo is is his real name, but for some reason, we have changed it very politely to Cordillo, and that's because the word Gordillo in Spanish means little fatty or little fat man, (laughs) and so this is a lot more polite than the word Gordillo. (laughs) But yeah, and and that all comes from Charles Fraser's knowledge of the history of of the area, so it's it's all connected. He was very purposeful in, in making sure that historical names were used on streets to help preserve the heritage. Now, just down from Cordillo Parkway, down Pope Avenue, you run into Caligny Circle and Caligny Plaza. Who was Caligny? So Caligny is from the French part of our history, and that uh, really is the name of a man named Gaspard de Coligny. And the Coligny French pronunciation equates to Caligny in English. And he was the man who basically was at the at the root of all French initiative to settle North America south of the Chesapeake Bay. And Caligny had multiple motives for that, Uh, but primarily he wanted to have a good base from which he could attack the Spanish trading fleets, as well as have a place where the persecuted Protestants 
from France, the Huguenots, would be able to come and settle safely. Uh, He was a Huguenot himself. In fact, he was one of the leaders of the Huguenot movement in France. And he was also the head admiral for the French Navy at the time. He was pretty much responsible for all the French colonization activities in the New World, including the one up in Montreal or near Montreal in 1534. You mentioned Charles Frazier a few minutes ago, and we've done several episodes on Charles, and I'm sure we'll do many more. One of the things that I haven't talked to at all with any of the folks that we've interviewed has been where Charles pulled all the street names in Sea Pines from. I get a lot of relatives that have come down to visit and, and you know, stay in Sea Pines and they're all like, where did all these names come from? <laughs> Just some, some odd ones throughout there. Do you know how Charles decided to select the street names used in Sea Pines? You know, Jay, I don't know specifically uh, how he decided to select the actual names, but I do know that they picked, I mean, there were categories that were decided on that would be good for names of streets in an environmentally sensitive and friendly, you know, natural wildlife oriented kind of an environment. And so you have, you know, the categories of things like animals and birds, shells, trees, shrubs, flowers, that kind of thing. As I said, he was very cognizant of the historical significance of Hilton Head. And so you have things that relate to landowners, the names of former plantations, explorers, even Civil War things. And other parts of the island have other categories, too, that apply, like boats and ships and nautical terms and fish and aquatic species and those those kinds of things. But I, I don't know specifically how he decided on the actual names, and I'm not sure if he did or if he just gave some broad guidance that we should draw names from animals and birds and bird species and shells and those types of things. There's so much rich history with Hilton Head and the names that are down there. Um, I was flipping through the slideshow that you sent me, and we could spend hours and hours and hours probably <laughs> on names, but one that, that kind of just popped out to me was Robber's Row. Yeah. Where did that come from? So Robber's Row uh, came from our Civil War history, and during the Civil War, the the Union Army basically targeted Hilton Head and Port Royal very early in the war for basically an invasion to occupy the territory. And the Port Royal Sound area in the mind of the North at the beginning of the Civil War was synonymous with the epicenter of secession because of all the activities of Robert Barnwell Rett and the Bluffton movement. But it was also uh, synonymous as being kind of the heartland of slavery, that location to which most of the slaves that came into uh, the southeastern slave markets in the first 50 years of the 1800s came to the area of the Sea Islands in South Carolina. And so because of those things, Lincoln personally was involved in the selection of the Port Royal Sound as a site for the invasion. And he wanted to deal a very powerful psychological blow to the South right in, right in its heart. And that was why the Union came ashore here in the first place. Uh, the depth and, and size of the harbor uh, at Port Royal was another very important reason that this was picked as the target for the invasion. But once they came ashore on Hilton Head after the Confederates had evacuated the island, the Union Army started to rebuild the fort. It started to create a number of buildings in what ended up being a town that had a a population of around 35,000 and a whole bunch of warehouses and a hotel and a huge hospital that's four times the size of Hilton Head Hospital today. It had a massive dock going out into Port Royal Sound, about 1,400 feet. It had a tent city where most of the troops lived. And then Right next to where the tent city was, in between the tent city and um, the warehouses, uh, ended up being a location where the merchants that were following the army would come and set up their shops to sell their goods to the troops. And because of the outrageous prices that they charged, it became known as Robber's Row. And Robber's Row is in Port Royal Plantation and is one of those one of the streets named for the area out near where the Union encampment, the main Union encampment was. There are so many names that are on this list, and we may end up having to come back and, and do <laughs> another episode on some other ones. I'm going to pick one more, and I'm not sure the importance of this or not, but okay. as you leave Bluffton, you come over the bridges, you actually hit Jenkins Island before you get onto 
Hilton Head Island. Who was Jenkins? Uh, there were there were a couple of Jenkins. Uh, Isaac Jenkins was the first Jenkins, uh, and he was one of the w- man who owned uh, plantation lands on that piece of land, uh, which really was connected to Hilton Head by a causeway very late in its existence. But to start off with, Jenkins Island is the area now known as Windmill Harbor on Hilton Head. And then it also continues across what is today 278 over into the area where the Hilton Head RV Resort is on that end of the island. And it was originally sold by Alexander Trench, the man who was hired by the Baileys to sell the land that they owned on Hilton Head. It was sold by Alexander Trench to a man named Captain John Gascoigne. And Captain Gascoigne was the person who was hired he was a French captain and a cartographer. He was hired to come in to survey Port Royal Sound and the connecting waters. And he's the man who did probably the most detailed maps from the early 1700s. He came in about 1725 and surveyed the area and sounded all the depths and the creeks and everything else. And based on his time here, Gascoigne eventually wanted to be a landowner. And he ended up purchasing 500 acres on Jenkins Island. At the time, it was called called uh, Hog Island, H-O-G-G Island. And he ended up pur- purchasing that 500 acres from the Baileys. And then when Gascoigne ended up uh, passing on, his heirs sold it and it was purchased by Isaac Jenkins. And then Isaac Jenkins owned the land along until Jenkins and his heirs owned it until the time of the confiscation, which was 1861. Okay. So I'm going to put you on the spot now as you did your research on a lot of these names that are on here, what's the one that you found that was maybe the most obscure, most fascinating? Did you have one that was like, wow, that's kind of a crazy story? One that's always fascinated me, as I have driven by it many times over the years, is Lego Mutton Road. <laughs> Lego Mutton Road comes into Marshland Road over in the area near Indigo Run Plantation. And I'd always wondered about that. And when I did my research into leg of mutton, it is just basically a name for a, a sail, uh, a certain sail shape that has a triangular shape that resembles a leg of mutton. And so leg of mutton road is, is one of the roads that, that is named for us for sails or parts of ships on Hilton Head. But the name of Lega Mutton was always one that got me. Another one was was uh, Falcata Road. And I, I couldn't figure that one out because that didn't seem to fit with anything. It almost had a mid-Asian kind of a sound to it. But what I, what I ended up figuring out there is that that was a very short, sharp, curved Spanish sword that was worn by the original conquistadors when they came into the area. And so the name Falcata Road is is given to, I think, one of the streets over in Hilton Head Plantation, I believe. How can people learn more about the names of Hilton Head Island? Is there a book? Do you do presentations on the names? You know, Jay, there's no, there's no book. I don't do presentation. I mean, I, I do presentations, a lot of presentations. I haven't yet done one on Pathways to the Past, which is what I call the street names of Hilton Head. It could easily be a book. It's full of fascinating information, no question. Uh, the derivation of the names um, is extremely significant in almost every case. Yeah, there's a lot to be learned from knowing about where the street names come from. Absolutely. Rich, thank you so much for your insight. We really appreciate you being with us today. Jay, again, a pleasure and I look forward to hopefully being with you again sometime. Please visit HiltonHeadHistoryTours.com to find out more about tours with Rich and look for Backwater Frontier, Beaufort County, South Carolina at the forefront of American history. It's a great read. We will see you next time as we travel down 278 to Lighthouse Road. 